Hey, Hi, everyone. everyone. Welcome to Emma Talks, a conversation show where we pair entertainers and creatives with experts in all sorts of fields dedicated to saving Mother Earth. I am Drew Scott. This is Linda Fan. My question is, which one are we? What do you mean? Like, Are, are we Drew? experts or are we entertainers? Well, you think you're an expert in everything, which is pretty entertaining. So you're a bit of both. So I'm a hybrid. I'll take that. No, that's fine. Anyway, in all seriousness, this week, we are beyond excited and honored to be having a conversation with fellow Emma board members and close friends, Ashlyn and Philippe Cousteau, about their amazing foundation, Earth Echo International. Earth Echo is a nonprofit that works to inspire youth all over the world to act now for the future of our planet. Most recently, Ashlyn wrote Oceans for Dummies, a fun and easy to understand book explaining the entire ocean, the ecosystems, history, climate, currents, species, and more, published February of 2021. Together, Ashlyn and Philippe dedicate their life's work to share their love of exploration, nature, adventure, all to empower and educate the world through storytelling. I get excited talking to these guys, so I think we should stop and just dive right in with Ashlyn and Philippe Cousteau. That was a good one. Dive. I didn't even notice I did that. <laughs> dive. You guys, it is so exciting for us to catch up. It's been too long. How have you been? <laughs> I know. We miss you guys, and, and you're only a few miles away. We could like... We can air hug. I know. Uh, we ca- miss you so much. Casualty <laughs> of the coronavirus, but um, hopefully things are getting back to normal so we can all get together soon. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've obviously had a very productive quarantine. We have your new book right here. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing. I'm I'm learning and relearning so many things. Honestly, right off the bat on the first page, I was like, I didn't know this. I have a challenge because I've been reading through. All right, let's see if Linda knows this because I've already gotten, oh, I'm great. sort of like the halfway through and I like to go all over from front to back. He's such a nerd. All right, let's see if we all know, what are the different quadrants of the oceans? Let's ask the expert. I know this. <laughs> okay, but no. I, I know. I, I created an, an acronym, PAISA, yep. P-A-I-S-A. What, are, is that what you're asking? Pacific? Or? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Indian. I'm not going to do it in the Paisa format. Okay. Arctic, Southern, and Atlantic. Atlantic. Yep. Bravo. There you go. Bravo. Do I pass? Am I official? Do I get a sticker or something? I, we're send, we'll send you your certificate. There's a there's a tattoo. It's an entire <laughs> back tattoo from shoulder. Perfect. I have a dolphin on the lower half, so it's also very uh, yes, oceanian. Ocean. It'll, it'll fill right in. It'll, 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 it'll be perfect. But it's true. Like that's that was one of those things where there so many people just assume that our our globe is made up of different oceans. And Philippe and I, that was our biggest kind of uh, a quandary when we were trying to put the title of the book together. You know, it's technically not oceans; it's only one ocean that is all around the world. But everybody calls it our oceans. So we went with oceans for dummies. Um, but here's and- the other thing that I, I like about how you named your book, because we call this Earth. But you guys really bring up the point that what is the majority of Earth? The water. Exactly. The That's, ocean. <laughs> why is it all, it's something we don't think about, you know, and, and continues to be I think, underestimated and undervalued um, in the world today. And, and you know, when we were approached originally by Wiley Publishing, they were like, hey, do you have any ideas for the Four Dummies for our Four Dummies series? And we did some research and we were like, wow, there is like Four Dummies books for everything, but there is not one about the ocean, which is the majority of this planet. Yeah. Um, so putting that together has been our, our project the last year, one of many. And, and it's just a reminder of, of how oftentimes out of sight, out of mind the ocean is, yeah. even though it's the thing that like makes life on earth possible, so. Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I could have sworn that we were taught oceans, yep. right? Probably were. Okay, it's not, it's not just me. Cause when oh, I, yeah. oh, no, we okay. were all taught that. And, mm-hmm. and I think that it's actually been like kind of, a, it's been a movement kind of recently to be like, yes, there are different ecosystems and there's different oceans around the globe, but they're all connected. So it really yeah. is just one continuous giant ecosystem. Um, Because what happens in the Southern Ocean, what happens around Antarctica is actually what feeds the tropics. And so it's literally from food, goes all the way down from the Southern Ocean, all the way up and around into the tropics, then back up into the Arctic where it gets nutrients again and they come back down. That's also what controls the, 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 the climate and the temperature of our entire earth. So it's like, it's just people think that, that the poles are so far away, but really they regulate 
everything that we do pretty much every day. Yeah. Well, and, and like you said, too, in your book, you're talking about how, you know, some people may think, oh, we're in the middle of the desert. We're not really affected by the oceans the same way. No, everything is affected by the ocean. And you were talking about ecosystems. I want to talk about a very specific ecosystem. It's called Earth Echo International. You stole my segue. I knew segue. you were going to say that. So can you tell us <laughs> about the organization? Segway master. The segway yeah. king here. That's all I got. Um, well, you know, and that and that's it. So Earth, Oceans for Dummies, this book has been part of kind of our broader uh, vision and purpose in life, which is to help people connect the dots between the health of the environment and the health of ourselves and, and our security and our economy and really life as we know it. And so um, another part of that is our work at Earth Echo, which is really focused on youth and focused on education. We've been around 15 years now, and it was founded as an organization inspired by my grandfather, Jacques Cousteau, and my father, Philippe Sr., uh, and their work and their focus and their belief that, you know, before we talk about conservation, we have to talk about education. And so we, we've reached over 2 million kids around the world um, that we've activated with our programs of the last decade and a half. And uh, um, every year, hundreds of thousands, millions more. And we're really, really excited about the growth that we've seen in, in a new generation of young people that really care about these issues and really are fired up and engaged about these issues from Nigeria to Brazil to Australia to Los Angeles, I mean, all over the world. And um, that's, that's one of my, my day jobs. And really, frankly, amidst all the bad news that we hear about climate crisis and biodiversity climate, all the stuff that's in the news, working with kids is really what gives me hope moving forward every day. Seeing their passion. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think that gives the whole world um, you know, motivation to do better and do better now, because when you have these kids telling us adults what to do, it's like, well, we got to get our act together. Like we have <laughs> kids saying like, this is our future and we all need to work together now. Like it's, it's in everyone's hands. And yeah. I love the way you talk about um, education preceding conservation in that same way. Can we talk about how education of oceans can precede our talking about climate issues? Yeah, That's and, a great point. and I think that, you know, when, when we talk about education, we don't just mean the students that Earth Echo uh, works with. We're also talking about uh, people in, in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, because, you know, ocean literacy as a whole um, is lacking uh, in the United States and it's lacking all around the globe. Um, I remember, you know, I took AP biology in high school and we didn't talk about the ocean at all. Um, and so it's just one of those things where the ocean is just kind of always second fiddle to everything else, but really it is the most powerful and, and one of the best solutions that we have to these huge crises that, that we're facing. Well, it's your point, Linda, when, like, like, for example, the climate crisis, climate change, it's an ocean problem. There was a recent survey that uh, Pew Charitable Trust did around the world asking world leaders to rank the issues that they, that they think are most important. Climate change tended to be towards the top, mm -hmm. ocean conservation, ocean health towards the bottom. Mm -hmm. And that's the disconnect that we're struggling with mm -hmm. because it's the oceans, as Ashton explained earlier, the poles, for example, that drive that interchange of warm and, and, and cold energy throughout the planet that drives our climate, which thus drives our weather, right. which means crops and rainfall, food, uh, you know, and all of these different things that we take for granted and maybe don't connect the dots with, 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 with the ocean every day, but do have, but are related to the ocean and, and the fisheries that feeds so many billions of people every year and the economic value of the ocean that is in the trillions uh, for the global economy every year. And and so um, fundamentally, when we don't understand the ocean and how the ocean works, we are, we're lacking in enough, enough appreciation for thus the solutions and what we need to do to solve these big problems like climate change. We need to solve ocean problems in order to solve all these other problems. Yeah, yeah as, as carbon continues to be such a huge issue from all the fossil fuels that we're burning, you know, our, our ocean is our largest carbon sink. It has absorbed over half of all of the carbon emissions that we put into the into our atmosphere. Now, the problem with that is, as it absorbs the carbon, it actually um, becomes more acidic, um, and it becomes warmer for for other reasons as well. So, what we are doing is hurting the ocean. Then, when the ocean is hurt, it can't help us the way yeah. that it is. So, it's almost like it's um, 
we need to make sure that that when we are making these decisions, that we're really thinking about the ocean and how it can be helpful. Because if we can get 70% of our planet, which is what the ocean covers, to help us, uh, it'll it would be a good thing. <laughs> yeah, it would be a great thing. I, I think that's our conversation here about carbon and and what the ocean does to suck that carbon out of the air. Um, it was reminded me of a documentary we watched not too long ago called Kiss the Ground and talking about dirt, um, soil health, and how the soil can actually help the same way in pulling carbon out of the air. And it's actually the infrastructure of what you have for cover crop or whatever you may have, it helps keep more of that moisture in the ground. But as we were learning more about how this soil is going to help every everybody and it's going to help farmers and our climate, we start to understand too how it's the same cycle coming from the ocean because where is that water coming up over from pre uh, precipitation and then into the into the soil. So literally there is no hierarchy of uh, order of what's important. It's all one big important conversation. And a part of that too is the food side of things with the ocean that you guys talk about. You mentioned, you know, how it has enough protein, the ocean has enough protein to feed, you know, to feed over a billion people. Can you talk a bit more about that side? Yeah, what's so interesting is if, if and when our ocean is, is healthy and abundant, it can feed what some experts think a billion people a day, a healthy seafood diet, a 1 billion people a day. Um, and what the problem is, is right now about 90% of all of our fish stocks around the globe are either fished at capacity or they're overfished. So literally what's happening is we're fishing ourselves out of fish. Um, but if we fish smarter, which means just making sure that uh, like some species of fish uh, actually become more uh, fertile, the older they get. So if you leave one 80 pound, is it tuna? I forget if it's tuna I mean, or sturgeon. Tuna, most species, but tuna, sturgeon. Any of the large, the large predators, they actually will release one, one female, older female can release more eggs than like 30 smaller ones. Wow. So it makes sense to leave that one older one and you can still fish the younger one. So it's, it's we just need to be smarter about what we do. Um, uh, and, and if we do have this, this healthy thriving system, we would be able to feed everybody on the planet and not just seafood. Uh, as you said, Drew, uh, you know, the, the water cycle starts in the ocean. So a healthy ocean means healthy precipitation, which means healthy rains for all of our crops on land. Mm -hmm. um, so really the ocean is pretty much vital to anything, any morsel that you put in your mouth, the ocean helped, um, no matter if it's meat or vegetables. Yeah, I'm just seeing as you're describing all of these systems, like arrows everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's so connected. And is. I think that's the great thing about um, your book is that you break everything down. I think the the thing that is hard to grasp, even though it seems so obvious that oceans can save us if we save the oceans, even though that seems so obvious, it's hard to grasp because it is such a vast and large thing. And a lot of people live their daily lives without coming into contact with the ocean or seeing it. But so, so I understand when people don't see that this affects their daily lives. Can you talk about how this is affecting our everyday? Well, so when we think about, um, of course, the difference first, the, the difference between climate and weather is something we go into in the book a little bit in, in you know, a lot of people uh, forget what that difference is. And so you'll sometimes hear people, detractors, things like climate change, be like, oh, well, it's, it's really cold in the middle of the summer in Texas, or there's snowstorms like we just had, you know, down in Texas. And so there's no such thing as climate change. I mean, remind people weather is the, 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 the essentially what the weather looks like outside your window over a short period of time. Climate is what the weather is over a long period of time and the averages. And over time, the average uh, of our atmosphere and this planet has gotten warmer. Now, that is something that has historically, another, another uh, trend that we look at in the book is we look at the history of the evolution of the planet. And there's one thing that we see over and over and over is these climatic changes that have happened throughout the, the eons, the millions and millions, hundreds of millions, billions of years that the Earth has been around. And what we've consistently seen is, is these fluctuations in carbon, the atmosphere getting warm, and then an ice age, and then warmth and an ice age, and warmth and an ice age. And we've seen those changes, however, over hundreds of thousands of years. What the human beings have done is we've interrupted that carbon cycle, taken all that carbon that's been sequestered in the Earth through oil and gas and coal, and artificially put it into the atmosphere. So we've accelerated these kind of climatic changes in the space of 150 years from hundreds of thousands of years. Mm -hmm. 
And, and ultimately what that does then is it's, is it's had these kind of tremendous impacts on weather. Um, so already today we're seeing extreme storms that are affecting people. We're seeing more extreme storms every year than ever before to the tune of the cost of, of, of tens of billions and hundreds of billions of dollars to our, our economy, uh, suffer, countless you know, lives lost, suffering. We're seeing freak storms because as our jet streams and those large scale global climatic um, phenomena are changing because again, the ocean is getting warmer and its ability to transport heat and cold around the world is changing. We're seeing things like jet streams change. So we're seeing these big polar vortexes where all of a sudden you're having this really cold weather come down into New England or into a place like Texas, which was just so devastating for so many people. And so those are the, just one example of the kinds of immediate impacts we're seeing bigger or more powerful monsoons in some places and weaker yeah. monsoons in others. And so we're seeing Messes already agricultural shifts system. in crops. We're seeing mass migrations of people in places like Africa and Southeast Asia driven by this today. And thus, conflict that's starting to happen. And so connecting the dots, as you said, there's all these little arrows that go out on yeah. all over the place. When we start thinking and why we wanted to talk about the ocean today as a topic was really because this is something that, that doesn't get enough attention, mm -hmm. um, either here in the entertainment space, you know, in, in, in Los Angeles or, or really around the world at the, at the conversations at the highest levels. Um, people recognizing that when we talk about ocean health, we're talking about our health, we're talking about human health, we're talking yeah. about our weather and our food and all of these other things that are affecting us already today, every single day. Yeah. And, and I think one, one thing that doesn't help is that there's so much misinformation out there um, or, or just theories that maybe people have had that aren't based in any fact. And so there, there's a lot of um, things that people believe, or there's no hope. People think that there's no hope. Um, can and you if I can add a pun, it, the misinformation is drowning out. Yes. Science. Yeah. Good one. Yes. Well, well done. Give me that yeah. right there. That was a good one. <laughs> Virtual fist bump. Yeah. Boom. Can you guys uh, talk a little bit about that though? Maybe what what is some um, maybe you can do some myth busting here and let us know what are certain things that you've heard about the ocean specifically or just climate in general um, that is something that you've learned as misinformation that would be nice for people to know. I mean, I think uh, again, one of the biggest things is when you talk about climate change and people misconstrue climate for weather. So when you do have a uh, you know a snap cold front or a snap heat wave in during you know a time when it's supposed to be cold, people are like, well, see, it's not real. Uh, I remember when one specific person during a um, winter in New York City, he was on a news organization and he said. Well, I just opened my window in New York City and it's cold. So climate change isn't happening. Yeah. Right. That, that person <laughs> went on to be the president. Well, I was gonna was not true. say that, but yes, <laughs> that person was not fully informed, is not fully informed of the, really the difference between climate and weather. And there the science, I mean, we have been looking at the uh the temperature of our planet and the temperature of our ocean. We have been going back for hundreds of years. And you can't dispute the temperature readings from all around the globe. They are steadily increasing. And even, even more thousands of years through core samples of coral reefs and That's ice, true. you know, and ice uh, and glacial uh, um, core samples that go back thousands of years, looking at you know carbon carbon density mm -hmm. in the atmosphere, temperature, things like that. You know, tree rings also you can use to like track uh, climate history going back thousands of years. And so. Um, all of that indisputably demonstrates that the earth is getting warmer at an accelerated rate, far more so than at any time in our history. And uh, the consequences of that are, are, are significant. But then again, it, you can get tripped up on some things. For instance, um, when people think that um, when ice sheets break off, they think that that is going to contribute to sea level rise. Well, interestingly, ice that is already on the ocean that doesn't contribute to sea level rise because it's like when you put an ice cube in your in your drink, the water already, you know, as that ice cube melts, the water level stays the same. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's the melting of land-based glaciers, snowpacks, and 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 the pulling out of water from our aquifers. Um, that is what is increasing sea level rise. But the most important uh, factor on increasing sea level rise that doesn't get that much attention is that. What happens when water is heated up? It expands. So it's actually the warming ocean temperature that is creating most of our sea level rise. So the ocean itself is, is expanding. expanding. That's the main cause of sea level rise right now. Yeah. 
So it's so interesting because people don't talk about that. People get hung up on um, debating whether or not, you know, oh, this huge ice sheet broke off. Oh, that's such a shame. And then people come, well, that's not sea level rise. It's like, oh my gosh, people are fighting over the most minute things. Yeah. When really what we should be fighting about is how many people are going to be displaced when the sea level does rise because it's yeah. rising. And how many people are already displaced? Exactly. Yes, exactly. I have a question about sea level rise too, because again, this is a part of, you know, maybe it's not even just misinformation, but it's misunderstanding the information. And, and it doesn't help when people in certain uh, influential positions are the ones that are giving that wrong information, not unknowingly some of the times, like, yeah. like even our teachers in school. Like I, we have teachers that, that were t teaching us things and they didn't know, but you think that you need to listen to them. So I remember, you know, growing up in Canada, and uh, they were talking about um, when you're looking at d before land dinosaurs back in the day when you had all it, it, when you're finding fossils from 500 million years ago and they were all the sea based um, mammals whatever wait a minute, or the fossils from the sea based uh, creatures and dinosaurs I don't know my <laughs> my terms but anyway they were saying to get to a lot of them it's up at the top of the Rocky Mountains they said you go all the way to the top of the Rocky Mountains and that's where you see the best fossils and they're they're fully formed and these are from all the sea creatures from 500 million years ago is that meaning because we've actually had massive water loss or is it just because of mountains growing over billions uh, over hundreds of millions of years that the, it's pushed out of the water because i was always in the impression that with climate change we're getting more and more loss of water so um in fact a couple of different things a combination of different things uh, i'll do i'll do the movement yeah uh <laughs> you're like linda and me we'll do this, uh, yeah. do this. no no the movement of the Yes. Okay. So, so <laughs> in in one factor is that during periods of of very warm spells in our atmosphere, uh, when Antarctica was a continent, wasn't even covered in ice. I mean, it is a continent, but when it was not covered in ice, it was dry land. When we didn't really have nearly the glacial maneuvers and glacial mass that we have today, the ocean was a lot higher. Uh, and so there were inland seas in places like Colorado, in the middle of, you know, Wyoming. There were these vast inland seas that because, uh, 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 because the water was higher, these long flat plains that even today are only a few feet above sea level were under several hundred feet of ocean. Mm -hmm. And so areas that are dry now um, have fossils from when they were covered in shallow seas. But another reason that you might find at the top of a mountain well, and because really the, we've always had the same amount of water on the planet. Um, once it was fully formed, it's always kind of in the same amount of water. It just either was in precipitation, it was either frozen, it was in humidity or things like that. But also, you know, our continents keep moving. I mean, still today, the continents are moving. So everybody uh, probably knows Pangea as like the best, super coolest uh, supercontinent. But actually there's been a few times that all the continents have come together and left and we're actually moving towards another supercontinent right now uh i think amasia was i think amasia is, is, one is, word. So, is like the, the new name they want to they want to do it very it's cool tectonic place the Everything plates just, just keep going back and forth like mm -hmm. this right so the atlantic ocean is growing the pacific ocean right now is shrinking mm -hmm. um and over time north america will connect with Asia and create this massive continent and then it'll split apart and spread it, you know, again. So yeah. None of us will be here, obviously, yeah, but not something any of us have to I will. Wear. I don't plan on leaving because I, I want to witness this in person. I am not leaving until calm down. Here. There's no like new beachfront property being created. No Wait, new no, it's it, like our, our continents move at the rate of our fingernails growing, yeah. which I always just think is fascinating. Like your nails is. grow very fast. Unzipping. My and nails grow crazy fast. Yeah, that that that's oh, amazing that's to me cool. though, and that's why. So that's very interesting because I remember them telling me that there was the the ocean came right through the middle up from Colorado up into Alberta, and yes. they showed me on on a map that it would this would have all been ocean, and here are the wetlands, and that's why we have a lot of dinosaurs just outside of um, Calgary. There's a place where we go to the to see dinosaurs. Yeah, that's right. Museum. Yeah, so that that makes more sense. We know. But and, and well, and also I should add that as the, the, the continents are colliding, you'll have, you know, the pushing up mountains. So you'll yeah. have something that was a seafloor. Yeah, that's true. Over a couple of million years, you get pushed up, and then you up. have a 
seashell at the top of your mountain and they're like that doesn't make sense but that? geologically speaking it, it makes sense yeah. this hmm. is also exciting <laughs> yeah we want to make fun like that was the funnest part about about writing uh was just sitting literally i i, I wrote most of the book from the corner of like the our bedroom and just sitting and and like really like diving into some of these facts it is just fascinating uh how how our planet works i mean it really is truly it's so you can't make it up it's so cool like it's give just us crazy. give us more of these facts i'd like you just nice and easy lay out some of the most cool um jaw-dropping facts uh let's see here okay so salt water does not kill germs a lot of people think or they were probably told by their mothers like i think i was that if you have a cut you should get in the ocean because it'll clean it don't do that Oh. Um, if you have a cut, maybe stay out of the ocean because millions and billions of viruses and bacteria live in the ocean. Not to scare people from going into the ocean because most of them won't harm you. But you know, if you have a giant massive gash on your hand, probably better to stay out of the ocean until it's healed. Um, oh, here's a good one. Uh, sometimes we've heard people asking us, you know, some can some penguins fly? No, all penguins are swimmers they use their bird they use their wings to swim no penguin can fly another one is a lot of people think um uh ask what's the deadly they think like the deadliest oh, yeah. animal in the ocean is like a saltwater crocodile or great white no, shark. Like, like a jellyfish. A jellyfish it is that's right a box of jelly yes well done uh <laughs> by far and i mean i'm talking like like they'll really deadly. kill you like they'll kill you in under a minute if enough of their you get enough uh, of the venom from them um, so fun things like that. Or like, um, why is the ocean blue? Some people think it's because one. the water is blue. Some people think it's because of the reflection from the sky, but that's not true. Water has no color to it. It's clear. Um, but what happens is uh, water absorbs the different wavelengths of light. Mm. And one of the first things to go is red. So it leaves the blues. So our eyes hmm. see the blue, which I've always thought is so cool. But that's why, so when you go diving, uh, old school scuba divers used to just before like depth gauges back in the day, like really early scuba diving, like Philippe's grandfather's time, they would just wear a red ribbon around their wrist. And when the ribbon turned dark purple to black, they knew they were at about 60, 60 to 80 feet, feet 100 feet. Oh, wow. That's crazy. Um, because yeah the red red light spectrum goes first and then the last one that i really like which is always fun to remember when you're out swimming in the ocean a lot of people think that salt water is just salty water it is not there can be millions of bacteria viruses tiny I said organisms that. that's why i said don't swim when you have a cut well for a cut but also just <laughs> like it's not salty so like when you go and you, like that's all over you all the time and you're in the ocean or all these different things so i always think about that when i'm in the water and i you know, you get a mouthful of salt water. I'm like, ooh, what's all this stuff? Like, I just oh. think of the millions of creatures and that little I've amoebas swallowed. floating around. No, that have been peeing in the ocean the whole time. And I just... And that yes. swallowed. Oh, you were swimming in like some massive amounts of amoeba and whale pee all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, but that's cool. Yeah, you know. <laughs> you know, hasn't it heard it says. <laughs> so it's, uh, I, I do remember though, talking about the ocean uh, color. I, we, I worked in Banff um, up, up in the Rockies. Uh, when I was out of high school, it's beautiful up there, but we would have tourists that would come and they know nothing about the mountains or nature and whatnot. And they would ask us, we had this several times where they say, so how often do you paint the bottom of the lakes blue? Because it's, it's blue like we've never seen before. And you and, told and, them every other And I month. said, yeah, it's every it's once, <laughs> once a season. But they, <laughs> they thought we would drain the lakes and then paint them blue and then fill them back up. Or they say, you know, the, the wild animals, like the, the elk, they're like, um, do you bring them in every night to pen them? And then you let them out in the evening? So it's it's just funny. And these, these are, you know, people from big cities and whatnot. And you'd think that they would have that common sense. But people don't have common sense about the planet. It's true. It's Unfortunately, so true. It, it holds us back from making good decisions then in terms of how best to protect all these things and take care of all these things. And that was the main thing that, you know, that, that we wanted to bring across was this idea that, you know, protecting the ocean is protecting us and caring about the ocean is caring about us. Uh, Sylvia Earle has a great line that says, um, you know, we, we need to protect the ocean like our life depends on it because it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, on that note as well, I mean, there is a lot of doom and gloom out there and I think that one thing that I really love with you guys, though, is you're showing hope and you talk about hope all the time. So can you go into a little bit more about what gives you hope? Yeah, I think that, 
you know, specifically for, for me, and I, I know as well for Philippe, um, when you hear when you hear these stories and when it's your it's your job every single day to to be thinking about these huge issues and and you know we have a, a daughter and we're currently you know constantly thinking about her her future and what that holds for our environment and for her health it's really scary but i know that the the first time it really hit me was you know i always knew in my heart of hearts i always understood that nature is resilient like I always knew that it was explained to me and I was like, okay, I got it. But it wasn't until I saw it firsthand. And that was when uh, we went out to the Marshall Islands a couple of years ago, which is where the United States did their nuclear testing during the Cold War. And in one area specifically, Bikini Atoll, it's where we detonated the largest hydrogen bomb the US ha has ever made. And it, I mean, when they, when they actually, triggered it, it, the blast was so big, the scientists didn't even, they were shocked. They, they really didn't think it was gonna be that strong. It vaporized pretty much everything within miles of the blast site. It turned the sand into glass. It was so hot, the actual blast. And so it killed everything, um, all the species, all the coral, any birds, any fishermen that were in the area, everything died. But we went back just 60 years later and when we first got in the water, we didn't know what to expect. And I have to tell you, it was one of the most moving and amazing things I've ever seen. We were surrounded by about 70 gray reef sharks. Um, there was coral, the, some just beautiful, healthy coral as far as you could see. There were giant clams. They were, I mean, it was just a perfect ecosystem. It just, so it didn't just recover, it was actually flourishing because it be, had become a de facto marine protected area because the islands are still radioactive. So to just see from literally going from the worst that humanity can do to anything is like nuclear. Armageddon. Ar yeah, yeah, it's just uh. kill everything. Um, then Jen, just 60 years later, it's, it's flourishing. It was, it, it's even more beautiful and healthier than before that was such a thing for me that I was like, oh my God, it was like a religious experience. I was like, yeah. this, it works. Nature can do it. And, and we've seen it all over the world. Yeah. The, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a saying from one of the uh, scientists that studied Chernobyl and Pripyat, the town there mm -hmm. the, at Chernobyl that was abandoned after yeah. the explosion. And he said, you know, between um, nuclear uh, uh, fallout and radiation and humans, humans are worse for nature. Um, and you have, uh, you, but you see a reminder, as Ashlyn said, of, of how nature is resilient. And so, you know, there's a lot of, there's new movements going on that we're very involved in called 30 by 30. Um, and that's a belief that, the, and, a, and a campaign to establish and protect 30% of the ocean by the year 2030. There's only around six or 7% meaningfully protected right now, because, you know, in the last 40 years, we've lost half the world's biodiversity. So we have a, as, as you both know, you've met her, um, Vivian. We have a little uh, little daughter, she's almost two years old. And so in our lifetime, since I was her age, half the biodiversity on this planet has disappeared. Um, so we've got a lot of big problems. And yet we know that if we give nature a time, set special places aside, that nature can be resilient and bounce back. And that's gonna be a fundamental and critical tool in our, in our, in our war against climate change uh, that, that, that's coming and already happening is giving nature a leg up, giving nature an opportunity to be as healthy as possible. And so those are the kinds of tools that exist that are, are hopeful tools that we know work. Yeah. And that's the message also we wanna bring around to people is that you know, when we think about it, and this is you know, particularly in, 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 in conversations about conservation and conservations about human health and security and our economic sustainability, like the ocean and the environment is, is, is the foundation of all of those things. So despite all the bad news out there, when we act in certain ways and we leverage some of these types of tools, we can support really good outcomes for the environment and thus for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and we can feed more people, we can have cleaner and healthier air. I mean, I think the coronavirus is a great example, right? We were looking here in Los Angeles at like the cleanest air in 50 years because people weren't driving gas guzzling machines all over the, the ocean. Plane. You could see it in the ocean. You yeah. could see, I mean, see clearly. I remember one day we were up um, hiking and I looked out and I saw this plane taking off and landing. I was like, that's not LAX though. I mean, we could see planes taking off and landing in Orange County from LA. 
And it's amazing. Like you don't think about what the impact and it's shown how many millions of people have been proven a year die from air pollution, die from you know the water pollution issues we have all over this country, not to mention around the world. And so all of these things are connected, but if we give nature a chance, it can recover it. And that's a hopeful message. Well, and there's a, that reminded me of another little fun fact that, that I didn't really know until I thought about it and put it into context. Um, if the ocean was a country, um, its GDP, the, the, the amount of money it would make every year, would make it the seventh largest in the world. So technically, when you hear of the G7 summit with the seven largest you know, countries or the, the countries with the seven yeah. highest GDPs, the ocean should be the last one at the table. I think it knocks out Brazil. So sorry, Brazil. But like, that's how much, you know, that is how important our ocean is, even if you just want to look at it from a financial standpoint. Yeah. Um, and, and a healthy ocean means that it would make more money, that it would generate more money, it would provide more jobs, provide more food. So it's like, even the cool thing about the ocean is, even if you don't care about the environmental impact, ugh, which would hurt my heart, but even if you don't, uh, you can still look at it from a monetary perspective. You can look at it from a safety perspective and you yeah. can look at it from a food perspective. So it's like really the, the ocean does everything for us. And, and we just hope that, that more people uh, will, will realize that and, and want to protect it and use it as an ally. Yeah. 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 It's in everyone's best interest to, to team mm -hmm. up and, and save the oceans. Um, so in addition to supporting organizations like Earth Echo and 30 by 30 campaigns, um, what can we do individually in our own homes um, to start making small changes, you know, right where we are now? Yeah, I think, well, there, you know, there's, there's two, two really big things that we can all do. I think number one is, is, is look at our own personal carbon footprint. Um, you know, look at the way that, that you use transportation and, and the type of transportation that you use. You know, we're lucky that we live in the middle of everything. We have one car, we walk pretty much everywhere. We, I think we've been driving the car maybe like three miles of like a week um, recently. Um, but that to, you know, what uh, we're gonna be building a guest house. So what kind of appliances are we gonna put in there? What kind of insulation are we gonna put in our Green house? Green building, things yeah. like that. The Which, food that we eat, 40% yeah. of the food on earth is wasted. So thinking about what we do with our food, how much food we consume, what we do with that food that we're you know, not even composting, simple things like that, buying local, buying organic, buying from community farms to help support local economies, um, how we travel, where we go on vacation, the places that we stay. There's a lot of, uh, um, this is gonna be relevant in the next year because I think we're gonna see an explosion of people wanting to get out of their houses. So there's a lot of hotel chains and groups that are really thinking about their carbon footprints and, and doing, uh, making better choices with that. Um, and also who we vote for, I think is really, really important. We've got to vote the ocean, we've got to vote the environment and be it Republican or Democrat, we have to send a message to elected officials that these values should be universal truths of clean air and clean water are non-negotiable. Like yeah. we can argue about all sorts of different policies, but we need to protect the ocean. We need to protect our air. We need to protect our water for ourselves and for our children. And so, so who you vote for, what you're eating, how you're building, where you're going on vacation, I mean, really all of our choices that we make. And what's that? Plastic and plastic. Plastic is another just huge, huge, totally man-made issue that the ocean is facing. Um, yeah. We get about 8 million metric tons of new ocean plastic that's entering our ocean every year. That's about uh, one New York City garbage truck every minute, just dumping uh, plastic right into the ocean. So it's just as simple as uh, just every every time you go to the grocery store and, and whatever product you need, just try to see if there's a non-plastic alternative. Um, yeah. No one can be perfect, uh, but everybody can be a little better. So that's just, you know, try not to get takeout as much as possible. Try, which I know has been hard for people right now, especially with, with kids at home. But just just try try to do a little better every day and you'll get there. Which, and do you find from what you've researched too, for example, takeout, um, I, I've actually found a lot of restaurants are now switching over to compostable or they're using different materials like bamboo uh, or whatnot instead of plastics. What do you find for uh, for practices in that sense? Or we had a refillery, uh, Refillery LA has come and they've filled us up so we didn't have to do one use plastic toss out. We keep our jars and then they just come and fill us up. We love that. And there's there's so many companies now that are, that are and usually they're, that have been started by younger people because they know this need, right? There's so many new companies that are out there that, or, or Blue Land that looks at how you, how you clean your house. So not only is, are the, are the bottles 
you know, reusable or non-plastic, what's also in the ingredients are non-toxic. Because remember, whatever you put down your drains ends up more or less in the ocean. It ends up in our watershed, but also back into the ocean. What you put on your yard ends up in the ocean. And even cat poop. A lot of people don't think about this, but cat poop, people flush, sometimes flush their cat poop. But here in Southern California, there is a specific, um, uh, it's not a virus or a bacteria, I forget what it is, but there's a, there's a specific thing in cat poop that can get flushed that because goes, of bacteria, bacteria goes different. out to the ocean and it kills our sea otters. Yeah. Oh my oh. goodness. So, so you're, saying, like people... you're saying this is a reason why people shouldn't have cats is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> saying <that. laughs> no, not saying that, not saying that. <laughs> We're a dog family, but yeah, like there's so many different things we can think about. We talk a lot about it in the book and, yeah. and you know, also just, uh, I think common sense. I mean, you know, if you're going to yeah. put a lot of fertilizer and stuff, not that it rains a lot in Southern California, but we have had a lot of rain the last few weeks. You can put a lot of fertilizer and things in your lawn. Don't do it right before it's going to rain. So, you know, simple stuff, maybe say no to the plastic bags at the store. Um, maybe you don't need to buy bottled water because bottled water actually isn't that, um, the standards for bottled water is, is oftentimes the standards in municipalities like LA, it's higher. Than the standards for bottled water. So, and, and you know, actually, on the bottled water side of things, one thing that we had learned, which I want to learn more about, though, is some bottled waters are stripped of all minerals and anything that's possibly in there, which is not healthy for you. Some of those better. things you want to have. Basically, exactly. like drinking distilled water, which is is not that great for you. So, you know, little unless things you're like on that. like a deserted island or yeah. something like that, then yes, drink distilled water. You don't, you don't have a choice. <laughs> but, uh, but little things, yeah. you know, little things like those kinds of small choices to the big stuff. I mean, who you're voting, that really is what, what yeah. it comes down to. I mean, who true. you're voting for. Um, and, and as a storyteller, listen, you're both storytellers, we're storytellers sharing these kinds of this kind of information around around the, the dinner table mm -hmm. at your place of work, being an advocate for these kinds of issues in your community. That's another really powerful thing we can do is become a storyteller. So think about our own choices, what we're buying. Bono said shopping is politics. Think about who we're voting for and becoming storytellers for a better world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think everyone can do that. And it's all about having the conversations. I mean, I think we went on for 10 minutes with like cool, fun facts about the oceans that you didn't know. And I think if we continue to have those conversations at the dinner table, who knows what you know will become of it when we step outside the door and what uh, how our uh, de decisions will be impacted mm -hmm. because of that yeah well you, you change you know from inspiring somebody by one action that you make changing one other person's mind to, to make positive change it's a chain reaction and i i think one thing i actually do love with your book too is that especially the for dummies series it makes it approachable for people to learn sometimes there are books on the ocean or other important topics that are so overwhelming and and they're written in a way that is not user friendly um, yeah. I love that you really speak to people's heart about this and make it easy to understand. Well, and I have thank to give you. a thank you because it was really Ashland. I wrote three of 24 chapters. Ashland wrote 21 of 23 of four <laughs> chapters. I helped create the photos and I edited. Yes. But Ashland did. was really Ashland's tone and her experience as a journalist and, and a storyteller um, well, that came through. So I, and, I, well, I, and I, honestly, I'm Drew, that, that's that. exactly why I wrote the book because when Philippe and I first started dating, being a journalist, I was like, oh, I really need to really need to brush up on this, this whole ocean subject. And there really wasn't there. It was either like little kids books or it was books that I would have picked up if I was studying marine biology. And so there right. really wasn't anything in between. And that's, thank you for saying that because that's exactly the tone we were going for. We want people to be able to sit down and, and not feel like a dummy because honestly, everybody's a dummy about something. Even if you're a coral expert, you're not going to maybe know everything about shark anatomy. So we just yeah. wanted to make it easy to understand, digestible, a little fun. Um, oh, we hear it. We we actually hear the way you speak. We hear it when we're reading this. Like <laughs> the creepy creatures in there, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. That it made it fun. So 100% awesome. Yeah. It's very encouraging to hear though that when you first started dating, you thought, "Ooh, I got to brush up on this," because reading this book and anytime we talk to you we just get the feeling that you were born with this knowledge. Like, how does she know all this stuff? But it is just a matter of experiencing and being open and, and learning as you go. Being so it exposed is very to it, yeah. encouraging. 100%. 100%. Well, thank, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. We hope to see you in person soon. And uh, yeah. Yeah. if you want to send us a pop quiz, by the way, on, on the oceans, by all means. Yeah. Send I'm impressed. I'm impressed. <laughs> You're definitely doing your homework. Um, we'll have to think of something and do it. Yeah. Yep.